I'm going to I'm going to kick it off and with a, I want to welcome everybody to the uh, to the tonight's presentation. It's jointly sponsored by the Tennessee Valley League of Women Voters uh, member at large unit and the American Association of University Women, the Huntsville branch. And um, I am Kathy Jones. I'm the chairperson for the for the Tennessee Valley League unit. And Dana Wimpey is president of the AUW Huntsville branch. And we're very excited to have Alabama Secretary of State John Merrill tonight as our guest. And he will speak to us about the uh, Alabama selection and voting systems. We appreciate Secretary Merrill coming to Huntsville. And he is an Alabama native with a, a long a heritage of, of uh, family members that are, have been in politics and public service. And so um, he's carried on the tradition and he graduated from the University of Alabama. And he interned in the U.S. Congress as well as being an intern for Senator Howell Heflin. In 2010, he was the elected representative of the um, 62nd District in the Alabama House of Representatives. And then in 2014, he was uh, elected to be the 53rd Secretary of State of Alabama. And as the Alabama's chief election official, he has ultimate authority over the elections in the state of Alabama. He's also um, the national co-chair of the National Association of Secretaries of State Voter Participation Committee. I think you said you're now vice, vice, vice president of the whole, of the whole um, committee. And he's also on the NASS rep, he's an NSSA, NASS rep to the steering committee for the National Voter Registration Day. And uh, you're the, um, you oversee the entire southern region for, you can clarify that for the whole region, and um, that's that's really important to the League of Women Voters because the League was one of the founding partners for the National Voter Registration Day, and it's held annually since 2012 on the 26th of September, which was just yesterday. And we actually have a a, a um, registration event we've had to put on Friday, so for this for this event as well. So we're looking forward to to hearing more about that. And uh, tonight we're looking forward to hearing about the issues and challenges that are facing Alabama's election and voting system. I wanted to give you some comments about protocol for the meeting. We wanted to have a, an environment that's frank and, and um, respectful and we welcome your questions. And we'd like to uh, ask you to provide your comments on the index cards and then we will um, take them up and after the presentation we'll have as many questions and answers as we can and then what we'd like to do is just type them up and send them to Secretary Merrill uh, tomorrow and then he can um, respond and we'll, we'll let you know what if we get additional responses there's maybe none needed we may we'll cover them all so with that I'd like to welcome Secretary of State Merrill Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be with you tonight in Madison County. This is one of my favorite places to visit. As a matter of fact, when I was campaigning for this position, I traveled all over the state. I went to all 67 counties at least two times during the campaign. I put 181,351 miles on my car and four sets of tires over that two-year period of time. In Madison County, I had the privilege to visit 53 times during that two-year period of time. The people here were very generous to meet with their votes, and I was excited to be able to continue to develop some relationships that we were able to initiate during that process. And anytime we got the opportunity to come here, we're always excited about being with you. I'm delighted to have my wife Cindy with me tonight, and I hope that you'll make her welcome at this time. <laughs> You know, I'm not going to assume that anybody in here knows me, knows anything about me, or knows anything about what we do. So bear with me just a minute as I give you a brief orientation as to what I'm charged to do as your Secretary of State. And I hope that you'll feel comfortable asking some questions. I know that they've established a protocol for you to deliver those to me. I have a presentation I'd like to make to you and then some questions that were provided to me by the organization that I'll try to address as well. They may cover your questions. Cindy and I will be here until the last person wants to visit with us tonight. 
before we return to Montgomery, and I always try to be as available as I possibly can. Let me tell you what I have given you before we begin. This is a copy, your copy, of the 2016 annual report for the Secretary of State Office. If you don't have one, please raise your hand. One will be delivered to you. Inside there, I hope that you, you have, she needs one right here. <clears throat> Inside the front cover, you should find a brochure. That brochure features Cindy and me on the cover. Inside that is an encapsulation of the services that are provided by the Office of the Secretary of State. If you open that, you will see a copy of my business card. And on the business card, you'll see my name, you'll see my title, you'll see our switchboard number, my email address, and then you'll see my cell phone number. Now, no matter where I go, I have people that always ask me, why do you give your cell phone number to everybody you come in contact with? There are 4.8 million people in this state. Why don't you give them all your cell phone number? If you don't remember anything else I tell you tonight, you don't need to forget this. I work for you. I work for all of you. I work for all the people that live in Madison County, all the people that live in the Tennessee Valley, and the people that live all over the state of Alabama. And if you want to contact me, you ought to be able to do so when it's convenient for you. If you call me and I don't answer the phone, I'll get back with you. But it's important for you to know that you shouldn't have to call 600 Dexter Avenue, State Capitol, with 105S, and ask to speak to me and be told by two secretaries that he's not here tonight, he's going to Madison County to speak to the League of Women Voters, and you'll have to get back to him. Because I work for you. Now, if that's not your expectation of your municipal, county, regional, state, and federal officials, you need to change the expectation, or you need to change the people, one or the other. Because I think it's important for elected officials to be available to the people they represent. Now, let me tell you a little bit about our office. The Office of the Secretary of State is the oldest office in the history of Alabama. Alabama had a Secretary of State before we were a state. In 1818, Henry Hitchcock was appointed by President James Monroe, who was our fifth president, to serve as Alabama's first Secretary of State. Now, he served ably in that role in 1818 and 1819. But on December 14, 1819, Alabama became the 22nd state admitted to the union. And since that time, we've had 48 individuals who served as Alabama's 53 Secretary of State, and I'm the 53rd Secretary of State. So it's not lost on me that there have been 52 before me, and there's going to be some number after me. I just hope it's not too soon. But with all the changes in Montgomery going on, when you go in the morning, you have to check make sure you're in the same office you were in the day before. <laughs> the code and the Constitution of Alabama give more than a thousand assigned duties and responsibilities to the person who holds this position. Now those include, but are not limited to, the things we concentrated on the most when I was campaigning and the things that we worked the hardest on since I've been the secretary, which are elections, election administration, voter registration, campaign finance reform, campaign finance review, all the things related to the election system. Business and corporations, licensing, trademark, anything to do with starting a new business, or making sure that the permitting process of expanding an existing industry or business is taken care of. And last but not least, international adoptions. Now the reason we've chosen those three areas is because those are the three areas that most directly impact the lives of Alabama families on a daily basis. We think it's incumbent on us to be responsive and respectful to the people of this state by representing them the way that we would want to be. One of the major commitments that I made as a candidate <coughs> that I tried to live up to as a secretary is to ensure that each and every eligible U.S. citizen that's a resident of Alabama is registered to vote and has a photo ID. 
That's really important, so I'm going to say it one more time. We want to ensure that each and every citizen of the United States that's a resident of our state is registered to vote and has a photo ID so they can participate in the electoral process at the level that they want to participate, whatever that happens to be. How are we going about accomplishing that? First and foremost, we reached out to all 140 members of the Alabama legislature. We asked them to give us three locations in their district where they'd like us to go to conduct a voter registration photo ID drive. We gave them an example. We said, we'll go to the Walmart in Dublin <coughs> on Saturday between 10 and 4. Why don't we go to the Walmart in Dublin on Saturday between 10 and 4? You got any idea? But that's where everybody is. We want to go where people are. We said, we'll go to Brown Chapel Church in Selma on Sunday between 10 and 2 for the same reason. We don't want to conduct a voter registration photo ID drive at Brown Chapel Church in Selma on a Tuesday night between 5 and 7. That's defeating the purpose. Matter of fact, we've been there three times on Sundays. Then we reached out to all the probate judges. We said, give us a can't-miss festival, event, or activity in your community where you want us to go to conduct a drive. So we've been to Chill County Beach Festival in Plain. We've been to the Peanut Butter Festival in Brundage in Pike County. We've been to the Peanut Festival in Dover down in Houston County. We've been to the Tomato Festival in Slocum in Geneva County. I was a Grand Marshal of that parade. It's a big deal to them. They got people dressed up like tomatoes and walk all the way to the town. <laughs> We've been to the Magic City Classic in Birmingham, <laughs> where Alabama State and Alabama A&M play every year. Draw 100,000 people to the event. And we've been to the Rattlesnake Rodeo in Ottawa, down in Covington County. We've gone to as many events and activities as we can identify throughout the state to touch as many folks as we can possibly touch. But I want to make sure we're reaching as many people as we could and raise the awareness of voter registration and photo ID. So in April 2015, I reached out to the two most recognizable people in the state of Alabama. And regardless of what you think, it's not Judge Roy Moore and Senator Luper Strange. It is Coach Nick Saban and Coach Gus Malzahn. And I asked them, will you Help us promote voter registration and photo ID. Will you make a commercial for me and allow me to use your likeness on posters? So if you look at the front of that publication, you'll see a copy of the poster that we use for Coach Saban and Coach Malzahn. 2016, I reached out to two people that are very recognizable in our state and asked them for their assistance. The first one, was Deontay Wilder, who's a heavyweight boxing champ. This is his poster. It's also reflected on your publication. The one of Charles is a little bit bigger. It's over there. And Cindy, if you want to get one out, show it right there. It's wrapped up. And then this year, we featured Jester Proctor, who is 2017 Miss Alabama. Cindy's holding up the one of Charles. Right there. Kind of did that after I said, Uncle Sam, I want you to register to vote. And I asked Dr. May Jemison, who's one of the first African American astronauts who the new high school here in Madison County is named for, to allow us to use her likeness. And she granted his permission. So, if you'd like to have one of these posters, or if you'd like to have multiple copies of them, we brought them for you tonight. They'll be in the back. You can have as many as you want. We'd be happy for you to have them. If we run out, we'll get you some more. We'd be happy to provide those to you. Now, with all that being said, I still want to make it as easy as possible for people to register to vote, 
for the change of voter registration record. So in January 2016, we initiated an opportunity that has never before existed in the state of Alabama. And if you have an iPhone or if you have an Android, you can go to the App Store, just like you do for iTunes, and you can download the mobile app to register to vote for the first time or to modify your voter registration record because there's an app for that. <laughs> and we'd love for you to use it. So if you, and it takes you straight to our website, as you can see. So if you move from Madison to Huntsville, if you move from the Buckhorn area down to Jones Valley, wherever you live, as long as you have a valid Alabama driver's license, you're going to be able to register to vote for the very first time or to change your voter registration record without ever going to the courthouse or to the board registrar's office and changing your voter registration record. Because we want to make it easy, not hard for people. Now, your next question should be, so what does all this mean to me? And how does it apply to what we're trying to do? Since January the 19th, 2015, we have registered 803,798 new voters in the state of Alabama. 803,798 new voters. That's almost a new congressional district in the state of Alabama. We're very pleased with that. We now have 3,298,011 registered voters in the state of Alabama, which is unprecedented and unparalleled in the history of the state. Both those numbers are unprecedented and unparalleled in the history of the state. And we're very excited about that. March the 1st, 2016, we broke every record for participation in the history of the state for voter participation in a primary for president or governor. In November, we broke every record for voter participation in the history of the state in a general election for president or governor. We're very, very excited about that. Now, there are still some people in our state who believe that the voter photo ID component was placed there for one reason, and that was to keep certain people, groups of people, or entities from participating in the electoral process. And people are entitled to their own opinion, but they're not entitled to their own facts. And the facts are, of all those people we've registered, all those that we have registered today, the records that we broke, we've not had a single incident of occurrence that's been reported to us. So someone was denied access to voting because they did not have a photo ID. One of the reasons for that, and you need to know this and make a note because all of you are very active. You may find someone that says, I can't get to the Board of Registrar's office and get an ID. I can't go to the place where the legislator identified for us to go. I can't go to Panama or to another location where you've got a festival and get registered or get a photo ID. So I don't know what I can do. I can do what you do. You can personally either with a phone call or with an email contact our office that individual can do that or you can do it on their behalf and we will like we have done multiple times go to their house and give them an ID we've done it for people that didn't even need the ID because it raised their comfort level because if you meet certain criteria according to the law that we passed in 2011 you don't even need an ID. 
If you're homebound, if you're disabled, you can vote absentee and you don't even need an ID. So again, people are entitled to their own opinion, but they're not entitled to their own facts. So I want to make sure you know that. Now I also want to talk to you for just a minute about another instrument that we've introduced that has improved the voting process. I would dare say most of you voted yesterday, or if you didn't, you voted on August 15th, and you'll probably vote on December the 12th. So you know what your voting experience is. You walk in, let's just suppose this is a voting location. It may very well be. This room may be the assigned location in the Huntsville Library to vote. You walk in that door. You got the table set up up here for checking in. When you come in, it says A through H, I through K, L through O, all the way to Z. You walk in, no matter what time you get there, no matter what your name is, as soon as you walk in, your line's along this line. Because that's the American way. <laughs> so you wait your turn till you get up there. You give them your ID. They got the eight inches thick of pages right there. The vote roll. They flip through all of that. They find your name. They check your name. They know it's you. They take the yellow highlighter, they highlight your name. You sign the sheet to check in. They give you your ballot, you go mark it, you turn it in, they give you the iPhone sticker. That's your experience. You're all familiar with that experience. With the electronic poll book, you walk in the same door, got the same tables, but there's no signs. You go the shortest line. No line, no way. You go up to the table. You give them your valid Alabama driver's license. They take your license and they scan it. And when they scan it, it pulls up on the screen, on the iPad that's being used as the electronic poll book, your image with your information and your signature. They give you a stylus pen, like you use at Sam, Target, or Walmart. You sign in, old worker matches your signature. It matches against the signature that's on file with the Alabama Law Enforcement Agency signature. When they check you in, you're automatically locked out of the other equipment. You can't go anywhere else and participate. If you voted absentee, your name comes up in red. You're not able to participate, except through a provisional process. Then you can challenge. It expedites your experience between 60 and 75 percent, depending on the poll worker and depending on the voter. In Mobile County, they average process 650 voters per hour. In Jackson County, in Scottsboro, they average one every 27 seconds. We used that system in Madison County in the general election. Only three counties used it in August and used it again yesterday. We hope to have it in place to be used uniformly across the state by 2022. We're trying to make it easier to vote and hard to cheat. That's the bottom line. We introduced those new technologies. The app, electronic poll book, and other things that we may discover. Because we're living in the 21st century. And we need to start acting like that. So we want to make sure we're doing what we can to make it easier for our people to participate in the electoral process. Not more difficult. And we're excited about that. Now, I've got some questions here that were presented by y'all. And I'll address those if you'd like me to do that. And then you may have some additional questions. Or you may have some that come up from my response to these. So let me start as we go through it. What are the policies and procedures regarding the maintenance 
of active and inactive voter roll. Now you would know, especially those of you who've been involved in the organization for some time, that in 1993, under President Clinton's leadership, the National Voter Registration Act was updated. And Alabama had never been in compliance with NVRA until I became Secretary of State. And one of the first things that we did was to start to do everything we could to make sure that we were in full compliance with NVRA. Because it's my belief that we should be in compliance with the law when the law has been passed. One of the things that we did in doing that was in late January, early February of this year, we contacted every voter that's registered in the state of Alabama through a postcard. That is the prescribed mechanism by the Justice Department, which in the summer of 2016, I went to Washington with two of my people, and we met with people in the Justice Department, and they approved our communication instruments for what we were going to use to contact all of our voters. Two instruments. That was the first one. As prescribed by law from the Justice Department. President Obama was still in office at that time. We reached out to every voter. That instrument, that post office, if it was not delivered, was designed to be returned to the point of origin. She got her. Thank you for bringing it. If it was returned to us, the next step was to contact those voters again with a prescribed instrument, another postcard, that was designed to follow the voter wherever he or she may have moved. So it would go where they were. There were instructions on each card as to what to do if you receive it. The vast majority of people, 90 plus percent of the people in the state of Alabama, when they were contacted, everything was fine. The rest of those folks were supposed to take some action to become active voters or to make sure that they were listed as active voters. Now, I don't like the term active and inactive because it leads you to believe that if you're inactive, that you're not participating. And that's not the case. Let me give you an example. August the 15th, 8.28 a.m. I'm sitting in my office. There's been a sign for me to use in the Alabama State Capitol. My cell phone rings. I look at it. It says Mo Brooks. I said, hello, Congressman. He said, John. I said, yes, sir. He said, we got a problem. I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm listed as an inactive voter. My son and daughter-in-law are listed as inactive voters. I have not moved from where I live. I've been living here for a couple of decades, and I vote in every election. I said, Congressman, I believe. He said, so what's the problem? I said, Congressman, I'm not sure, but I'll be calling you back. I hung up the phone. I called our election division. I said, would you please explain to me why Morris Baker Brooks Jr. Some of y'all may have just now discovered that's his <laughs> real name. Was listed as an inactive voter. Not only did they explain to me that Congressman Brooks' postcard had been returned, they brought me a copy of Congressman Brooks' postcard, which I forwarded to him and told him what had happened. He wasn't pleased, but he was satisfied with the explanation. Now, if you're listed as inactive, what we're now calling it is we want you to refresh or update your information. So if your information has not been updated, then what we want you to do is we want you to go to the website by using the app or use your computer at alabamavotes.gov 
or go to more restaurants, or, or you can do it on site. Fill out the form to update your information. Some people got irritated because they were listed as inactive. That's a protective mechanism that was placed there for the voter. That's it. And that's following the federal law. As a sign in the Clinton administration, and what we did was approved through the Obama administration. We're just complying with the law. Come to find out, Congressman Brooks was still not happy. And after the election in August, he went to the post office that runs his route. He spoke to the postmaster that's in charge of his post office. Lo and behold, the postal worker that runs his route went to his house with that post office, looked at the name on it, and decided it did not need to be delivered because Congressman Brooks's son no longer lived at that address. He didn't know that was Congressman Brooks, not his son. His daddy was senior. He's a junior. His son's third. I don't know what the other stories are. That one's applicable to you. He represents you as a member of the 5th District of Congress, and you all know it. But I think it's important for you to know there's a prescribed reason for doing that. If an attempt has been made, those two instances, you still did not update your information and you missed two consecutive general election cycles, then on the third general election cycle, your name is removed from the voter registration list. You can still register again, but it's removed according to federal law. That's the process. That's the way it happens. That's why it happens the way that it happens. They used to call that the purge. We're trying to get away from calling it a purge because the purge has negative connotations as well. And we say that you're removed because your information has not been updated. So that's the answer to that question. Any questions about that process? Okay. How many people have been purged? Uh, I can't tell you off the top of my head. I'm not bringing it. That's really important to you. You can send me an email to the address that's on that card. We can send that information back to you. If we voted in this last election, we're fine, right? Uh, well, now let, let, let me say this one more time. Congressman Brooks has never missed a vote. Okay? Oh. Never. That's not part of the process. Voting is important to be inactive, but confirming your information and making sure it's updated is the most important step. Now, obviously, you got a postcard because you didn't update your information when you voted on the 15th, did you? No. And you weren't asked to update it yesterday if you voted? No. And so you're updated. Okay. You're complete. You're where you need to be. Okay. So you would be told to Oh, yes, ma'am. Because okay. so they won't let you proceed okay. unless you okay. update it. Okay. And you can update it by using the mobile app. Uh, or go to alabamavotes.gov. So you're suggesting that we periodically No, ma'am. But I am suggesting you do that once every four years. Now, see, this is the thing that's so important. When this process started in the first quarter of this year, we sent out press releases. We did store, they were on WAFF, WAAY, 4831, WHNT, Channel 19. I'm on the Dale Jackson show. I'm telling anybody that will listen to it. Make sure people know this. Make sure people wear this. But then on August 15th, everybody's got a phone call and cussing us out. Okay? It's going to be every four years. Because they're trying to figure out what's going on. Okay? We just want them to know we're protecting them. So we're going to be pleasant. We're going to be courteous. And we're going to be generous with our time to make sure their questions are answered and they know what needs to happen. But I'm going to tell you now, it's going to happen again June the 5th, 2018 for the people that didn't update or haven't updated yet. That's the bottom line. And the main thing you need to remember about how many people have been purged <clears throat> is we got more people registered to vote now than we ever had in the history of the state. Ever. So 
we're doing what we need to do to make sure we're reaching for it. Yes, ma'am. Just to clarify, so if I got that postcard, I don't need it. Okay. If you read it, which I assume you did. I'm sure I did. Then you didn't probably you probably didn't need to take any action. Okay. So you're done. Okay. As were 90 percent of the people in the state so of Alabama. We, we will get those every four years. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So that okay. unless they change the law. Okay. All right. Because I'm new to this area. I've yes, only been here for a year, so yes, I'm still trying to get my feeling. Yes, That's why I'm coming to this stuff. Yes, ma'am. So every four years, <coughs> we are having to update or make yes, sure everything is. Yes, <coughs> yes, they might have done it another way, but what we're doing is a way that's been prescribed by the Justice Department and approved by the Justice Department to be accepted. Yes, ma'am. All right, let's go to the next question. Absentee ballot process. Now, this is what you need to know about the absentee ballot process. The absentee ballot process, the way it stands today, I don't really like it. Because it says that if you vote absentee, you have to tell why you're not going to vote after, you're not going to vote in person. You've got to provide an excuse or a reason. Alabama is one of just a few states that requires the excuse provision. It also requires a signature provision from a witness. No. That concerns me. And let me tell you why. It does not require that the voter get the witness to print their name and then give their signature. It just asks for the signature, which means you could fill out your own form, you could be your own witness with another signature, and you could turn it in and act like you're somebody other than you to do that. To me, that's a problem. There's no credibility to that. We tried to pass a bill this time to change that system, to add more credibility to it. We asked to remove the provision for excuses. Remove it. We asked to remove the provision for the witness. Remove it. Eliminate it. The only thing we wanted was to add on the front end, when you made an application, to provide a photo ID when you applied as well as when you returned your ballot, which is already required by law. But there were a handful of certain clerks around the state who reached some powerful legislators and asked those legislators to block the legislation. In doing that, it prevented it from passing the second chamber, which was the House. It had already passed the Senate. It was carried in the Senate by one of the most liberal members of the Alabama Senate, Senator Roger Smith, who is an African-American Democrat from Jefferson County. In the House, it was going to be carried by a conservative Republican. Because almost every piece of legislation that we advance is bipartisan. It's not designed to advance the cause of one party or the other. It's designed to improve Alabamians' ability to participate in the electoral process. Period. So we intend to bring that legislation back, maybe in a different form. But we have formed a committee with the absentee election managers and we will have our first meeting next month as we move forward in looking at what other states do and how they do it and putting us in a position to be successful in helping people be able to vote absentee better and easier. So their vote will be cast, their vote will be counted the way that they want it counted. Any questions about that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, now if they don't have to present an excuse and does it then become the possible that we would be able to have early voting then? I mean, that's, uh, the that's something else. Now, let me see. I don't remember early voting being on here, so no, if it's not. I was wondering if that's the fact. If, if, that if it's not, not I'm going to address that right now. Okay. <laughs> do, you, do you have a question about my, that? Too? My question is about early voting. Too. Okay, then let me go ahead and address that. 
A lot of times when I go and speak to groups, people will ask me, are you in favor of early voting? And what I tell them is, we have early voting. It's called absentee voting. Early voting, as defined, means that you are voting prior to election day. And then they say, well, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is in-person voting. That I can go wherever I need to go, walk up to the machine, have somebody check me in like they do on election day, and then I can get my ballot, mark it, and turn it in. That's what they mean is early voting. I'm opposed to that. And I'm going to tell you why. There's not been any incident, any occurrence that has been established, that's been reported to me, or information that's been made available to me, where early voting has done one thing. There is one thing that early voting has done in every state in the union where it's been introduced. You know what that is? What'd you say? Increased fraud? That's the answer I get every time I ask that question. But the answer is, is increased cost every time. Do you know what has never increased across the board in any state where it's been introduced? Participation. You know why I'm opposed to it? Because it's not incumbent on me to provide an opportunity for you to have a greater convenience than someone else. Now, you may see increases in Philadelphia, but you don't see them in Harrisburg. You may see increases in Pittsburgh, but you don't see them in College, State College. Pennsylvania. I'm telling you that overall, you've not seen increased voter turnout. You don't see it. This is the deal. When people go through what we went through in November. They say, we need early voting. I'd stay in line three hours to vote. What we need is increased efficiencies. What we see with the electronic poll book is increasing the efficiency. Those people's opportunity to participate was increased. It reduced their wait time 60 to 75 percent. That's what we need. You know, people remember that we had 70 plus percent of our people vote in November. We broke every record for the numbers of people that voted then and in March. You know what they don't remember? They don't remember that in the runoff. In July of 2014, then we had 11% participation statewide. Yeah. They don't remember yeah. that in the runoff in July of 2012, we had 5%. 5% vote statewide. And you know what? When you got early voting, early in person voting, it doesn't matter if you got 70% of the people voting or if you got 5% of the people voting, you still got to pay all those people. That are working. You still got to pay the security cost associated with the polls. You still got to pay the cost associated with securing the ballot, not just the process. And you got to pay all those people that are working that whole time. To me, that does not make sense financially. It does not make sense financially. Now, I'm going to tell you this nobody in this room had to wait to vote in August, and nobody in this room had to wait to vote yesterday. Because we had 18% of the people vote in August, and we had 14.5% vote yesterday. Now, you may say, well, I had to vote. I mean, I had to wait. Yeah, I'd like to do it at McDonald's. And that's it. So that's what you need to know about early voting. Now, in, in that same vein, I'll come back to the question. Sometimes, I get you after her. Sometimes people will say, well, what about other advances in voting, like electronic voting? What about electronic voting? I'm not for electronic voting. And we will not have electronic voting as long as I'm your Secretary of State. With one exception, if you are in the military and you're deployed, 
the U.S. government has sent you to represent us in some place that's not your home. And we were the first state in the union when this happened under our administration to have electronic ballot delivery and electronic ballot return. Now there's some other states that have it, but we were the first in the union to introduce it. And because of that effort, we had 84% of our military servicemen and women participate in the general election in 2016, and it led the nation. I'm real excited about that. Because I'm going to do everything within my power to ensure that our military service men and women who are working for us, protecting us, and representing us internationally are given the same rights that we've been given. Because to me, they even deserve it more than we do. Because if it wasn't for them, we couldn't do what we're doing. Yes, ma'am. So you just kind of hit on what I was going to ask you. Okay. But the um, in-person absentee ballot process is very common. Yes, ma'am, it is. And, and it just seems to me that if you had had this electronic absentee ballot, absentee ballot process available, that it would be a whole lot easier for you know folks. You know, my daughter was starting college and had to be there the week before the election, so it's like we didn't have a choice. And, well, let, let me say this, stuff. and I'm not going to get on you. No, I'm just saying. But, but I will say this to you about that. Yeah. The situation you just described is not much different from one that was introduced to me on Monday of this week, where it was Friday. When it Friday, we were in the call. My attorney called me. He said, "I've got this lady that's working the hurricane relief." She was assigned by her company to go work the hurricane relief two and a half weeks ago. She's in Florida now. She wants to know if because she's been assigned to go, if she meets the standard assigned by state law as an emergency provision. I said, well, you need to call her and you need to ask this question. When you were assigned to go, were you told that your situation was a week-to-week -week assignment or that you would be there in depth? He called. She said, I was told... I would be here till the work got done. I said, and she's done. Because she knew when she left, she didn't know when she's coming back. The situation you just described with your daughter, there's a 45-day window to vote absentee. 45 days, seven weeks, six weeks. You got enough time. It's just a poor process. I mean, that's the thing. Well, it's, it's, yes, ma'am, it's, it's, it's a process, but it takes some action on the voter's part. So because a voter waits to the last minute, and I know you've all seen this before, but poor planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on mine. We need to remember that in whatever we're doing. I'll get to you after I get him. He was next. Well, we, are, we, are going to have to, we are going to have to... Um, Okay. Yes. You are you deferring to her? Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I didn't see. That's okay. I'm getting this year and I have two questions. One dealing with the issue that you stated about the absentee ballot and you spoke to it just a little bit when you talked about the military because that was my question. Yes, ma'am. But it wasn't so much, I know we have it there, what I was concerned about, do you have the impact of what that voting is when those of us that are employed, deployed, and what that count is, what the impact of that vote is in terms of numbers? The I'm vote sure for those the Help me a little bit more what mm -hmm. you actually mean. When you say impact, what does that mean to you? To me, I meant the numbers. So you have, okay. so this this have is what I know. Historical data. Yes, ma'am. This is what I know. Okay. I know that 84% of the people that made application successfully returned their ballot and had it counted, and that led the nation in military response. Okay. I don't know what that number, physical number, was, and 
The most important thing to me is that 84% were able to do it. For whatever reason, the other 16% vote were, was not counted. That's a good answer. My second question, though, has to do with uh, um, do we have a process in place, or I know there used to be a process in place. Is there still a process in place for those individuals, those citizens that we have that have criminal or felony records? That's a great question. What is the yeah, and, and let me say, that was one of the things that was on the list. One of the things that you, you may not be aware of is when I was campaigning, one of the things that was introduced to me was that we had people in different parts of the state, registrars that are responsible for registering voters, who were interpreting the term moral turpitude in different ways. So you could have committed a crime and been assigned a fee or a fine or incarceration in Madison County that in Limestone County they would not have provided the same punishment and may not have treated you the same way. You might have been able to be a registered voter in Limestone but not in Madison. That concerned me because it needs to be uniform across the state. So one of the first things we did was introduce a bill on defining more turpitude. I had a very, very conservative Republican carry the bill for me in the House, and I had a very liberal Democrat who had made this an issue in the Senate, carry it for me in the Senate. Passed the House, went to the Senate, and died on the last day. Well, I found out he really didn't want it to pass. I don't know if he didn't want it to pass because we were the ones pushing it or what, but he didn't, he didn't want it to pass. So the next year, at the same House sponsor, passed the House again. Had a different Senate sponsor, passed the Senate, but in a different form. Went to conference, got it passed in the House, didn't get it passed in the Senate, died on the last day. This year, 2017, we passed the bill unanimously in the House, passed it unanimously in the Senate, where we define more turpitude. Now it's implemented in all 67 counties the same way. Now as a part of that, in 2016, I put a team together to study the issues of restoration and restitution for those who have been incarcerated. We came out with legislation that I had a conservative member of the Senate pass and a liberal member of the House pass. Uh, State Representative Chris England, who's an African American, who is one of Cindy and my neighbor. He lives less than a tenth of a mile from our home. Our districts were next to each other. Chris passed that bill for us. It was the last bill it passed as Mike Hubbard was the Speaker of the House. And it passed at 11.57 p.m. that night on the last night of the session. Now, what did it do? It enables the expedition of people who've been incarcerated, who served their time, paid all the fees and fines associated with the original sentence to be able to participate at the same level that you are and that I am. Because once they've done that, they shouldn't be delayed in having the rights restored. That's not right. So we want to make sure that those people were given the same treatment that you and I would be given as they would go to that point. Now, another thing we did was that we made sure that every sheriff in the state of Alabama knows that it's his or her responsibility, we only have one female, Anna, down in Decatur, in Morgan County, to make sure that they know they're supposed to address the right to vote absentee with all of the inmates that are in their jail. Now, they can't get out and go vote, but they can vote absentee. Wherever their home base is, if they haven't lost their right to vote because they've been convicted of a crime of moral turpitude or have lost their ability to vote, we can even register people to vote that are incarcerated if they've not convicted, been convicted of crimes of moral turpitude and lost their right to vote. Because just because they make some mistakes and they're incarcerated doesn't mean they shouldn't be able to vote. That's one of the ways to make sure that people's citizenship is restored and that they start to feel a part of the community again. Because they need to be able to participate at whatever level they can. So we have done that. I'm excited about it because it's important to make sure. Now, I will tell you, I've had some Republican friends that have said that, you know, that, that's not a good move politically for you. You know what it is? The right thing to do. And that's what we're doing. 
We also make sure that when people leave incarceration, that they have to, by law, go over that exit review with each and every person so they know what their rights are, and if they're not registered, that they can become registered to vote. Yes, sir, you got one now? Yeah, uh, I just, I'm trying to get better understand this. You said it was, you, you had 3.4 million people registered to vote in the high school. So 3.3. Yes, 2.3. 3.3. 3.3. Yes, sir. Sorry. Um, I just, I was trying to figure out other provisions. You said there, there won't be any provisions for expanded hours or opportunities for people to vote. Because I, I see every day where I work, I see every day where people are, are don't have time during the day. But let me say this, okay? Not to interrupt the train of thought, so come back with me if you don't hear what I'm saying. It's real hard for me to stand here and say we need to vote on Saturday. We need expanded hours to vote. When we've broken every record in the history of the state for voter participation in the most recent general election that we've had. Broke every record in the history of the state. So obviously, for those people that wanted to participate, they didn't have a hard time finding a way to participate. People vote when they feel a need and they have a desire to vote because they think their vote's going to make a change. That's when they vote. And when they don't, they, they do like they did yesterday. You got 14.5%. You got 85.5% percent sitting at the house. Wonder why these are our choices. Well, uh, just we don't understand if, if they're just sitting at the house or if they didn't have that opportunity. That's what I'm just saying. So there, there will be no provisions other than what's in place now to expand the opportunity to vote for. for no, the as long as I'm the secretary. Because we just broke every record in the history of this day. I, 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 no, I, I do understand that. We broke it. I do understand that. It is your turn. You have just eliminated an entire group of people of how many showed up in the last elections because the, there are people in the world who have zero flexibility, zero ability to take time off to go downtown or wherever they need to go during normal business hours, which are also their normal business hours, to begin the process of voting. For 45 yes, days? Yes, yes sir. No Absolutely. No matter. This is why Absolutely. you never have to Monday leave the comforts Friday, of your home. Five. No you never have to leave the comforts of your home to be able to vote in any election because all you have to do is download an application to vote absentee. Com yes, ma'am. Complete the application, mail it in, tell them where you want that ballot sent. They'll send it to your place of work. And then take it, complete it, return it, and you vote. And you must have internet access to Somebody well, look, you just said they were at work. There are very few places that work. No, no, those are the people. No, there's some access. that don't have internet access. There are some. But I will say this. If you will call them, if you will call them, if you don't have the internet, you can call me on my cell phone. All those people you're talking about, you can give them all my cell phone number. Thank you. And we will mail them an application. There's no excuse. Okay, so you discussed about the absentee ballots. Are those counted um, in the overall day of the election? Yes, ma'am. It has to be returned by noon on election day. Those are the first ones that are open and the first ones that are reported in every county in this state. Now, I have another question. Yes, ma'am. As far as the electronic poll books, yes, do, what provisions do you have in place to prevent hacking or? They're not linked to the internet, they're air gapped, and they are connected through a Bluetooth technology, which is what prevents anybody from being able to go from one to the other to participate. But there's no reason why those people would be able to fear that it could be hacked or that it's vulnerable. So could you still have paper um, ballots for backup just in case? Now wait, 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 wait. We don't have electronic voting. This is electronic check-in. Check, okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, and there would be one hard copy of the poll book available at each location where there's an electronic poll book available as well. Yes, sir. Okay, and now I just, for a verification, you said if you had a 45 day window to operate, to, to vote absentee. To vote absentee. Yes, sir. And I, I just want to get clear, we said earlier that 
Yes, sir. But see, that's the, that's my point. The excuse provision is really nothing. I mean, sure, you have to mark. I'm gonna be out of town. I'm at work. I'm at work. That was so one thing she it. said. So or I'm sure. doing this. Or I'm doing this. I'm out of the country. But what I'm saying is that's a bunch of crap. Because, and that's what I told the circuit clerks when I told them why we needed this pass. Because I said, okay, so somebody marks. I'm at work that day. I can't vote. Or somebody says, I'm out of the country. I said, how many of you have ever been to their homes to check to see if their vehicle was there? How many of you have checked to see that they were at work? Crickets? Crickets? None of them. Because they're not checking it. So why do you have it on there? It's a feel-good provision. Okay. It doesn't need to be there. Okay, so you, you, you promote it. It should be on there. I want it removed. Okay, all right. That's what I told you. I just had a bill introduced this time to get it out. So we can, they can have that absentee ballot sent to their home. Sure. And it would be the essentially the equivalent of a lot of states have voting by mail. I call this no excuse absentee. There you go. But That's what voting I call by it. mail, but it's not an ongoing. Sure. Because where I came from, it was they just sent it to me automatically. Yes, ma'am. Ongoing. But this one, you'd have to go and actually seek it out every election. Well, you just have to request that request application. Yes. Okay. And then they mail you the ballot and okay. you participate. And you can turn it in in person. Yes, ma'am. So DHS has put out that there were several states. Yes. 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 And we are one of them. We were one. And so what? We had no mean? vulnerabilities that were exposed. That you know of. No, ma'am. We had no vulnerabilities that were exposed. And we had no instances of occurrence where the attack was successful and allowed us to be hacked. There were attacks that occurred but we did not have any incident where a breach was reported. Did you know of those attacks before DHS told you? No, ma'am. Because they happened in selected locations, and when they occurred, and this is what DHS told us, I had a meeting with the DHS in Washington in February, and this is what I told the undersecretary that talked to us. I said, have you spoken to the individual who is the senior chief election official in the state where that occurred? They said, no. I said, have you spoken to the individual where it occurred in their community? They said, in most instances. I said, the person that you're talking to in the community has absolutely no ability to change what's happened or to correct the situation at any level. If you've not spoken to the chief election official, you're not helping us. And if you're not helping us, what are you doing? What are you doing? Now, I'm telling you, that's a problem. And so we had conversations with Vice President Pence. We had conversations. And, and our national president, County Lawson, is from Indiana. So she and Governor Prince, uh, Vice President Pence, are very close friends. I have met him on a couple of occasions, but he's not my friend. But Jeff Sessions is my friend, and Richard Shelby's my friend, and all seven members of Congress in Alabama are my friends, and I have made my position well known to them about what that means. And that's why we need to change in protocol on who gets contacted and why, so we can address it if something occurs. Now, we had no breach this time, but and we're happy that our fire laws have allowed us to protect the integrity of our process. But we're not confident that that will always be the case because things can always change. So we have to be diligent. Was it a firewall? Or was it well, let, let me just use that to tell you okay. that we had no breach. That's okay. the most important thing for you to know. Okay, because it's not all connected. You don't no have one way to get into no it, right? So. No ma'am. Okay. And our machines, that was, uh, that was one of the questions. Our machines would have to be individually programmed to be corrupted. Individually programmed. Because the way that they're set up, they're not linked with each other. So you can't go and just say, okay, I'm going to do this and this, you can't do that. So how did they, what did they do? I can't speak to that. It would not be appropriate for me to do that. Okay. And I know you understand that. Well, I really don't, but that's well, let me say that <laughs> you can take it up with DHS. That's what I told some of my trolls on Twitter. Let me take it up with DHS because I told you what I'm able to tell you. Because we don't all really have a need to know everything. We really don't. Even I don't. So, but it was a personal thing they went to this an elected official, elect a person in the process somehow, 
Someone was notified. Okay. And then that individual was told not to share it. Yes, ma'am? Um, now, I, I will grant you that probably um, the votes were not changed. But was there any chance of the voter list ahead of time being no, changed? Not in Alabama. No, ma'am. No, ma and, and our vendor has never been compromised either. So you can't say what area is? No, ma'am. area of Alabama? No, ma'am. So we have one more, maybe one more question. Yes, ma'am. We'll, we'll yes, ma'am. Now that there is a federal commission asking the states to turn over their voter rolls. Yes, ma'am. Is your office cooperating with that and sharing and our information And I would interpret your, your with question them. about cooperating with me, are we giving them data? Yes, sir. Okay, this is what you need to know. Our data is available to anybody that wants our data as long as they purchase it. What you will receive is you will receive your name, address, telephone number, birthday. You will not receive someone's driver's license number or someone's social security number. You will not receive that. You will not even receive the last four digits of a social security number. Chris Kobach, who is the vice chair of that commission, who is a personal friend of mine, he's the secretary from Kansas, started a firestorm by sending a letter requesting the data without even telling the other members of the commission what he was doing and without knowing what was able to be provided <laughs> by each state. I mean, the White House intern could have put together a spreadsheet, any one of y'all could have put together a spreadsheet and said, look, Secretary, this is what you can get from Alabama. This is what you can get from Georgia. This is what you can get from South Carolina and from Washington. This is all you can get. This is what you can get if you pay. But this is what you can get, and that's it. But he didn't do that. He did what he wanted to. He does that a lot. I still love him. But I will tell you that you have to understand that we're not going to provide. I told Chris, I got a text message on that phone. Cindy's got it right there. It says, Chris, and at the time, this is what I told him. You can have whatever you want from us. This is going to cost you $32,611.16 cash money. I will take credit card. Okay. Now, I know we're out of time for questions. I, I did have one oh, question oh, okay. that I was asked to ask. Yes, ma'am. Um, yesterday, do you have any idea how widespread the crossover voting was? Uh, we had some incidents reported where individuals crossed over and voted. Those people that did that were not eligible electors in that process. Those individuals will be identified, investigated, where it's warranted. They'll be indicted and they'll be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. I will tell you that each incident will be investigated. Like I told WAAY, WHNT, and Fox News channels last night, and a bunch of channels in Birmingham, it's inappropriate for me to comment on where those instances occurred or how widespread they were because it might jeopardize the investigation. I will not do that. You would not want me to do that. But I want you to know this too because this was a question that was on the sheet, and this is important for y'all to know. A lot of times I have people that ask me this question. How many cases of vote fraud have you had? Why don't you all be making a big deal about vote fraud? What's going on with vote fraud? Since I've been Secretary of State, we've had 370 unique, this is before yesterday, we've had a few more since yesterday, 370 unique instances of vote fraud that were introduced to us. We have gone through and validated, prosecuted, and situated 205 of those instances. The rest of them are still active. We have had eight instances that were reported where we received convictions or elections have been overturned or people have been incarcerated. Now, usually at that point, someone will say, well, you had eight. How many people did you say we had registered to vote? I said about 3.3 million. Then you had eight. And this is what I would say to that, usually. If I told you we only had eight people in the state that wanted to register to vote, or that wanted to vote, and I said, no, you, you can't. You're not going to be able to vote. Or you're not going to be registered to vote. It's only eight of you. Not a big deal. People be turned back flipped. 
talking about how sorry we were. How we were preventing people from participating. This is what I'm telling you. We're not going to have you can't eat too. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. We're going to make sure that people are treated right and fairly, period, across the board. We're going to make it easy to vote and hard to cheat. And everybody who wants to participate is going to be able to, but we're going to follow the law on the front end and the back end. Now, if you want to talk to me, because we're through now, you want to talk to me? We're going to be here to answer the questions that you've got. Oh, look, another thing that I, I didn't do and uh, I asked Cindy to do, I, I didn't ask her to do it correctly. We've got a sheet that we'd like to pass out to you. If you'd like to give us your contact information and you'd like to be on our list to receive our information mailed to you, emailed to you, if you'd like to know when the governor makes a proclamation, if you'd like to know, like we notified the media yesterday, that we had uh, validation that we were going to in, improve the process if somebody did not follow the law, they were going to be prosecuted, then you can sign up and you'll be notified. Also, weather emergencies and things like that, you'll get notices just like the legislators do. That's what they do. There's some points by this. So I wanted to, I wanted to thank you, Secretary Merrill, for coming. Uh, for coming.